everybody. Uh, chapter meeting of the semester. My name is Jack Hall and I'm the chapter president. Before we uh, begin with Professor Orman, um, I wanted to make a few brief announcements. Um, first of all, thank you to the Declaration of Independence Center on campus who provided the copies of Professor Orman's book. We really appreciate uh, y'all's assistance there. So thank you. I certainly am not complaining about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, also, we've done so well as a chapter this semester. We've been recognized by the National Organization of National Federal Society. They have uh, named our chapter as a finalist for the Alexander Hamilton Award for Most Improved Chapter. Um, so big round of applause for all of y'all. Y'all out there. And they couldn't guarantee that we'll ultimately win the award, but as a mark of how well we've done this year, they sent all of our officers a small bronze replica, replica of the actual award. So I'd like to go ahead and present that to our officers who've put in so much hard work over the course of the semester and year. So first of all, Vice President Caroline Heavey. Thank you. Thank you. Secretary Anna Tucker. Also, happy birthday, Anna. <laughs> She's that worth in U.S. dollars. It's priceless. Right, it's, it's priceless. Uh, Treasurer Matthew Black. Thank you for your service. Um, Communications Director Chauncey Mullins. I guess it means it's such an honor. I mean, Events Coordinator Shannon Curtis. Um, we have two Weddell reps, one of whom couldn't be here because she's working on a, a brief right now. But our other Weddell rep, Mason Cino, thank you. And you can probably bring those. Okay. All right. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Um, professor Elon Werman is an associate professor at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at Arizona State University where he teaches administrative law and constitutional law. He writes on administrative law, separation of powers, and constitutionalism, and his academic writing has appeared in the Yale Law Journal, the Stanford Law Review, the University of Chicago Law Review, the University of Pennsylvania Law Review, the Duke Law Review, and the Texas Law Review, among other journals. He's also the author of A Dead Against the Living, an introduction of originalism, and it's the second founding an introduction to the 14th Amendment, which you will sign copies of after this meeting. So without further delay, Professor Warman. Um, thank you for having me here to speak on the subject of my recent book, uh, the second founding, uh, an introduction to the 14th Amendment. Uh, what I will say is just a quick background on my experience getting here. I arrived at Memphis at midnight last night and then took a drive to the pod uh, down here. Uh, so I uh, got to the hotel around 1.30 in the morning, and I am about five shots of espresso in. So I don't know if that's going to be more energy than normal or less. We will uh, find out what the combination uh, creates. Uh, but in any event, um, thanks so much for having me here uh, to talk about this uh, book. The overall thesis of the book is that the central rights-bearing provisions of the 14th Amendment's first section, due process of law, the equal protection of the laws, and the privileges and immunities of citizenship are not these broad and open-ended invitations for modern-day judges to pour into the text modern-day extra-textual values, but neither do these provisions narrowly confine us to what the framers might have thought about specific problems in 1866 or 1868. It's neither so broad nor so narrow. But to make the argument for this, I have to say a little bit about the book's methodology and why it's different from every, every other book on the 14th Amendment or why every other book on the 14th Amendment is wrong with the exception of Professor Green's, actually he gets it 90% right, I think. Uh, so we're very uh, much aligned on that. Well, a lot of the books on the 14th Amendment resort to plumbing the depths of the legislative history of the 30th Congress, thousands of pages of the Congressional Globe. Uh, and though I, you may have heard the oft-quoted phrase of Judge Harold Leventhal using uh, legislative history to interpret statutes is kind of like going to a cocktail party, looking over the crowd and picking out just your friends. 
And you can find in the legislative history stray statements that go any which way. And this is sort of true of the Congressional Globe, too. So to give you an example, which I hope to come back to, but if I don't, you should ask me about it. Supporters of incorporation of the Bill of Rights against the states, their best evidence is a statement by John Bingham, the principal author of the Amendments for Section that he made in Congress in 1871, five years after the drafting uh, of the 14th Amendment. So that's just an example. Ooh, no more to about that part. Uh, so that's just an example of, of this, the, the potential risk for relying on legislative history. Other authors resort to uh, or focus on anti-slavery constitutional thinkers, abolitionist thinkers. So this is Randy Barnett's new book. Uh, if you've seen his new book uh, with Evan Burdick, they argue that these anti-slavery thinkers had an unorthodox meaning of the original constitution and that this unorthodox meaning sort of became the public meaning uh, of the 14th Amendment and the reconstruction of Congress. And my claim is that these provisions Again, due process of law, the equal protection of laws, and privileges and immunities of citizenship are written in the language of the law. My claim is that each of these provisions has a long antebellum legal history, and that through examination of that legal history, we can determine with reasonable certainty what the meanings of these provisions were without resorting to unreliable uh, legislative history statements, without resorting to unorthodox sort of public understandings. What's more, this legal history, these legal meanings, these legal terms of art directly solve the problems confronting the framers of the 14th Amendment and the 39th Congress, the comedy rights of free Black citizens for some states. Um, yeah, sorry. No problem. Never stood behind a podium in my life <laughs> to do a talk. Uh, the free black citizens of some northern states, what were the com their comedy rights and the comedy cause when they traveled uh, south? The widespread uh, private violence and mob rule against um, black persons and abolitionists in the south and the north. And also the widespread discrimination uh, in the so-called black codes after uh, the Civil War. Uh, my claim is also, by the way, that once we look at the legal meaning, it turns out it turns out that much of the legislative history and the anti-slavery thinking is actually consistent with that very sort of orthodox um, legal understanding. Okay, well, I can't do all of that in the 20 minutes that I promised to talk, 25 minutes, no, no more than that. So instead, let me make you an argument about the privileges or immunities clause. The clause of the 14th Amendment that says, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. You may have heard that this clause incorporates the Bill of Rights against the states. This is Akhil Amar's view, Michael K. Curtis's view, Kurt Lash's view, Randy Burnett's view, among others. In fact, I think it is fair to say that today, incorporation of the Bill of Rights against the states is originalist gospel. They say, you know, not under substantive due process. Most originalists say that's made up or that's an oxymoron or what have you, but it, it's correct under the privileges or immunities. You may have heard a variation from Randy Barnett, especially, but also others, that the clause not only guarantees the Bill of Rights, the states, but also other unenumerated, unwritten fundamental rights like contract and property, the stuff against Lochner against New York. So I think the debate today is largely over whether the Privileges or Immunities Clause only incorporates the Bill of Rights against the states or also does this extra thing, right? This uh, guarantees the unenumerated uh, fundamental rights. So my argument is that the best reading of the Privileges or Immunities Clause is that it does neither. It is not a fundamental rights provision at all. Instead, the clause is an anti-discrimination provision with respect to civil rights under state law anti-discrimination provision with respect to civil rights under state law. What does that mean? If I'm right, I think that means California can ban handguns. What California can't say is only white people are allowed to have guns. I think it means California can require a license to operate a laundromat in a wood building. What it can't do is grant every white applicant a license and deny every Chinese applicant a license. Right? Like the equal case. I think it means Texas can get rid of the exclusionary it just can't say, we'll only admit illegally gotten evidence when a Black person uh, is the defendant. You can't do that. That's discrimination. In other words, 
Fine rights, states can still regulate and define the content of civil rights. They just can't discriminate in the provision of those civil rights. Okay, why am I right about this? Well, the central piece of that, I wanna say two things, but the central thing I wanna talk about is the Civil Rights Act of 1866. It is undisputed. Well, I used to say that and then I was debating Kurt Lash and he says, I disputed, but he's wrong. Other than Kurt Lash, okay, other than Kurt Lash, no one disputes that a central objective of the framers of the 14th Amendment was to constitutionalize the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which I'll explain what I mean by constitutionalize. So it's undisputed that a key to unlocking the amendment's meaning is to unlock the meaning of the Civil Rights Act of 1866. Okay. So what was the Civil Rights Act of 1866? Well, after the Civil War, after abolition, okay, the Southern state governments, including Mississippi, okay, enacted the infamous and notorious Black Codes. In these black codes, the Southern government systematically discriminated in the provision of civil rights, right, to the newly freed people, right, here uh, in the South. So, for example, in, in these black codes, the newly freed people were not allowed to own real property. They weren't allowed to assemble together. They weren't allowed to testify in court to the same, same extent white citizens could. They had to enter, they didn't have the same contract rights. They had to enter into certain kinds of contracts, lest they be deemed vagrants subject to be uh, 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 forced, was basically sent to, uh, to forced labor. And they weren't allowed to own firearms. Dirks, daggers, swords, firearms, and munitions of any kind. These restrictions were not applicable to white citizens. It's basically a systematic denial of civil rights to the newly freed uh, men and women in the South. Hence, the Civil Rights Act of 1866 declared all persons born in the United States and um, not subject to any foreign power and excluding Indians not taxed, bracket that, okay? Otherwise, all persons born in the United States are hereby declared to be citizens of the United States. And such citizens, again, such citizens of the United States of every race and color shall have the same right in every state and territory to make and enforce contracts to sue, be parties, give evidence, to inherit, purchase, lease, sell, convey, hold, real and personal property, as is enjoyed by white citizens. As is enjoyed by white citizens. You know what the Civil Rights Act does and doesn't do? It doesn't guarantee any of the rights of lists. It doesn't define any contract or property rights. The states could still do that. All it said was if a state gives a certain civil right, a certain contract right, a certain property right to its white citizens, it must also give to its black citizens. Okay, free of arbitrary discrimination. It's an anti-discrimination provision with respect to civil rights under state law. Note also the terminology. We'll come back to this point, because I want to flag it now. Kurt Lash and others say the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States in the 14th Amendment, term of art referencing privileges and immunities in the federal constitution. But note the language of the Civil Rights Act. The Civil Rights Act declares persons born here to be citizens of the United States and says such citizens of the United States as a privilege of the United States citizenship are now entitled to equality in civil, uh, civil rights under state law. Relatedly, Andrew Johnson's veto message. Andrew Johnson vetoed the bill. Why? Because he said it contains an enumeration of those rights to be enjoyed by those classes so made citizens, citizens of the United States. What were these rights that they were going to enjoy? Well, contract, property, and so on, civil rights under state law. And that's precisely why Johnson vetoed the bill. Because where does Congress get a power to interfere with the civil rights legislation of the states? Your stuff of first year contracts, property, tort, criminal law, where does Congress get the power to do that, right? We have a division of federal and state power. Look through Article 1, Section 8. It's not there. Maybe 13th Amendment, but it's tricky, okay? So it is beyond dispute that that's why we needed the 14th Amendment. We needed an amendment to constitutionalize the Civil Rights Act of 1866, okay? In two respects, okay? The first is we need to create a grant of power. We need to allow Congress to enact the Civil Rights but that wasn't enough. That wasn't enough. Because what happens when the Democrats take over, as they did in 1875? What's to stop them from reversing the civil rights legislation of the Republican Reconstruction Congress? So you not only need to give Congress a basis of power, 
But in the words of James Garfield, future president, then representative, they needed to embed the principle of the civil rights law in the eternal firmament of the Constitution to insulate it against future change. So far, everyone should be on board. The question now becomes, well, which clause of the 14th Amendment constitutionalizes the Civil Rights Act of 1866? Well, I submit the Privileges or Immunities Clause for a few reasons, okay? At least four, because I want to talk about them briefly. One is note the parallel to the Civil Rights Act. The Civil Rights Act begins with a declaration of United States citizenship and says, as citizens of the United States, you are now entitled to civil rights under state law. How does the 14th Amendment begin? It's parallel, it's not, it's not identical, but it's parallel. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. It's at least parallel. If I'm right, the Privileges or Immunities Clause is also parallel to the Privileges and Immunities Clause of the original Constitution. Article 4, Section 2, also known as the Comedy Clause. This provision of the Constitution says that the citizens of each state shall be entitled to all privileges and immunities of citizens in the several states. What did this clause do? Well, it said that a state cannot treat the citizens of other states as foreigners as aliens. So if a citizen of Massachusetts is traveling to Mississippi, Mississippi must give that citizen of Massachusetts the same privileges and immunities, the same civil rights that Mississippi gives its own citizens. Can't treat that, that citizen of Massachusetts as a foreigner. You must treat him as a citizen. Okay, it's an interstate non-discrimination clause. Well, under my reading, the privileges or immunities clause does for intrastate discrimination, what the comedy clause does for interstate discrimination, which was the missing link, okay? I said, I come back to this. One big hiccup is the language. I think the language does the work that I'm describing. A lot of people say, well, it says, so the first thing is the word abridge, and Chris Green has done a lot of work in this regard, has often been used in, a, in, a, in the context of discrimination. One person's rights are abridged when that person gets a lesser set of rights than another person. Bridge fits comfortably in a discrimination meaning. Okay, the hiccup is usually privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. Doesn't that sound like the rights in the federal constitution? This is Kurt Lamsch's argument. But I think this argument collapses upon a moment's reflection. Because United States citizens have privileges and immunities from multiple sources of law. Yes, we have privileges and immunities by virtue of the federal constitution, but you know what else? We have privileges and immunities by federal statute law. Patent laws, uh, license to trade with the native tribes, uh, license to get a coasting, uh, 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 to get a coasting license. All of these from the 1790s, I'm just drawing three examples from the 1790s, were privileges and immunities of U.S. citizens under federal statute law. And United States citizens also have privileges and immunities from other sources of law, state constitutions, state legislation, state and general common law. All of these are privileges and immunities of U.S. citizens. So why would we limit the phrase privileges and immunities of United States citizens, right, merely to federal privileges and immunities? Right, in the federal constitution. It makes much more sense to think the clause refers to all the privileges and immunities of U.S. citizens, that it, was, it, that it is within the power of the states to abridge in the first place civil rights under state law, exactly the kind of civil rights discussed in the Civil Rights Act, which were there described as the privileges and immunities of U.S. citizens. Okay, the fourth and last thing I want to say about this, I eschewed reliance on legislative history earlier, so I save it for last, but every single member I mean, almost everybody connected the 14th Amendment with the Civil Rights Law. Most of them who connected it specifically talked about the Privileges or Immunities Clause. Said that is the clause that constitutionalizes the Civil Rights Law. With one exception, Jacob Howard, that I can find, who said, oh, I don't know, maybe equal protection. And he was confused about a lot of things, um, which we can talk about later. But this brings me uh, to my next point. What about the Equal Protection Clause, right? That's like the biggest counter argument. Doesn't the Equal Protection Clause guarantee equal laws, equal civil rights? And just so, my reading can't be right because the Privileges or Immunities Clause would be superfluous. 
Well, I hate to break it to you, unless you had Chris Green, what you learned in con law is wrong. Equal protection does not mean what you all learn it means. Equal protection does not mean equal laws. Equal protection requires equality in something very important, but much, much narrower, the protection of the laws. What was the protection of the laws? Well, in short, the protection of the laws was the flip side of due process of law. What's the process of law? Okay, whatever rights you have, however unequal they are, okay, we will only take away your rights. We will only take away those rights with due process. If there's established law and established procedures, right? So if Chris Green jaywalks, but jaywalking is not a crime, the legislature can't say, you know what? We really don't like the fact that Chris jaywalked the other day. Go to the Tower of London. You can't do that. Due process requires that there be law established in advance. And your violation of that law is adjudicated according to procedures known to the law, okay? By the way, you can tell that I don't believe in substantive due process, um, but I got to leave you something to read in the book. So I'll just, that's all I'll say about that. The protection of the laws is the flip side. It was the legal protection the government had to give you against private interference with your private rights. Okay, what happens when your neighbor commits a tort against you, commits a trespass, tries to convert your property, commits an assault or battery? Private people, not just the government, private people can also interfere with your enjoyment and exercise of your rights. Protection of the laws was the legal protection the government had to give you against private interference with your private rights. The principal requirement of protection of the laws was therefore judicial remedies. Doesn't define the content of any rights. It's judicial remedies when your rights are invaded. In addition to judicial remedies, actual physical protection from private violence was also required. Mob law, Lynch's law, was the quintessential violation of the protection of the laws. This was all over the literature, okay? Uh, well, don't believe me. We can believe Chris Green, who I think agrees with all of this. He was actually a trailblazer uh, uh, in, in this. But don't believe me or Chris Green. Here is William Blackstone, Chief Justice Marshall. William Blackstone, in his commentaries on the laws of England, said the remedial part of the law that is the method of recovering and asserting rights when wrongfully withheld or invaded is what we mean when we speak of the protection of the laws. Remedial rights. Chief Justice Marshall, Marbury v. Madison, the very essence of civil liberty certainly consists in the right of every individual to claim the protection of the laws whenever he receives an injury remedial rights. So the equal protection of the laws clause doesn't constitutionalize the Civil Rights Act because it doesn't guarantee equal laws, okay? However unequal your rights are, due process says only the government can take away your rights and only with due process. And the protection of the laws clause says that we will protect you so you can enjoy and exercise your rights to vote, to assemble, to bear arms against the Ku Klux Klan and other private violence, trying to interfere with your exercise of those rights. So if I'm right about this, and I am, okay, at least if you believe William Blackstone and Chief Justice Marshall, okay, then only the Privileges or Immunities Clause is available to constitutionalize the Civil Rights Act. And as I said, there are other reasons to already think that's true. Okay, I'm almost done. Let me say one more piece of historical evidence. The biggest argument for incorporation that Akhil Amar, Michael Ken Curtis, and others make okay, is that look at the widespread violation of civil liberties in the North and the South, okay, the widespread denial of free press and free speech rights to abolitionists, the widespread denial of the Second Amendment rights, the right to bear arms to the newly freed population in the South, okay, and somehow they, then they say this points to the need to make the Federal Bill of Rights applicable against the states so the federal courts can enforce these guarantees. It doesn't require that at all. We don't need incorporation to solve this problem. Why? Because every single state constitution as of 1868, every single state constitution as of 1861 had a free speech and press guarantee. Every single state allowed white people to keep and bear arms. Okay, well, if you allow white people to do it, the Privileges or Immunities Clause says now you must allow your black citizens to do it too, free of arbitrary discrimination. And if someone tries to interfere with your rights, the Ku Klux Klan or someone else, we will protect you. The government must protect you. And if the states don't do it, Congress will step in and do it. You just don't need incorporation to solve this problem. You just don't need it. Okay. How can I possibly be wrong about any of this? 
So that's, I think, the nutshell of the affirmative argument. Let me say one thing about implication. Let me say one thing about implication. I've already said, I think this means incorporation is wrong. States can continue to define and regulate civil rights. It just means that they have to treat their citizens equally. Okay. I think my reading or this reading, the correct reading, however you want to describe it, is the only one that gets us to Brown v. Board of Education. Now, we might not care about that. Maybe we think, who cares if originalism gets us Brown v. Board of Education? Who cares? You know, that's doing things back. But my point is it's a data point. Okay. Is public education a civil right under state law? In 1954, in Kansas. Yes, of course it is. If you tax your citizens and provide this privilege, it's a privilege of state citizenship, right? It's a privilege under state law. It is now a privilege of a United States citizen in the state of Kansas, okay? So at least the clause applies. At least the privileges or immunities clause applies to public education in 1954, whether this was offered, public education was offered or not in 1868 or 1866. Okay, so the clause at least applies. So then it becomes a merits question, whether separate schools are in fact equal or an abridgment of the privileges and immunities of black citizens. Well, forgive me anyway for thinking that this was an easy case. Okay, forgive me for thinking that Justice Harlan was right in Plessy against Ferguson when he said, we all know that the purpose of the segregation laws was not to keep the black man away from the white man so much as, sorry, to keep the white man away from the black man so much as to keep the black away from the white. Forgive me for agreeing with the legendary Yale law professor, Charles Black, who grew up in Texas. He said a few years after Brown v. Board was decided, this is an easy case once judges open their eyes to what every Texas schoolboy knows. As he said, again, he grew up in Texas that we did not enact the Jim Crow laws so that the races would be separate and happy and equal, but precisely to keep one race in a condition of subordination to another race, then it just becomes a system of caste legislation designed to abridge the privileges and immunities of black citizens. I think Brown v. Board is actually an easy case. What about Loving v. Virginia, by the way? What about Loving v. Virginia? Is marriage a civil right? Yes. It's it's a contract, too, in every single state. Marriage is a contract. Contract is the quintessential civil right. No one denied that marriage is a civil right, so the clause applies. In Plessy v. Ferguson, the court said, true, marriage is strictly speaking a contract. Okay, could have stopped there, right? So it's a civil right. The clause applies. Are the anti-miscegenation laws, do they bridge the privileges or immunities of Black citizens? Forgive me for taking Chief Justice Taney at his word in Dred Scott against Sanford when he used the anti-miscegenation laws as the principal example of why uh, Black Americans were a degraded and inferior race. Well, they can't even marry us whites. How can they be equal? Take that paragraph from Taney, plop it next to that paragraph from Plessy, easy case. Marriage is a civil right. Anti-miscegenation laws are part of caste legislation designed to abridge the rights of Black citizens. Easy case, okay? Let me wrap up by saying the, this last thing. My reading is the only reading that accomplishes any of this. What does, what does marriage and public education have to do with incorporation? Nothing. What does it have to do with substantive due process? Certainly not public education. Certainly not as 1868, if you the expert, substantive due process doesn't get you there. Procedural due process doesn't get you there. Equal protection gets you there if equal protection means whatever you want, right? Uh, but under the original meaning, it doesn't get us there. My reading is the only reading that gets us these cases. And so I guess I want to end by saying, not only do I think my reading is the best reading of the clause, maybe it's the reading we should also like the best. And I think that's all I want to say. Yes. I'll stop. Thank you for listening. And I listen. Before Chris Green gets up here, um, thank you for taking my free books. I'm happy to inscribe them after. I cannot guarantee that that will increase the value. For that matter, I can't guarantee it won't decrease the value, but you're all lawyers, so you know the caveat I'm tour. I'm happy to stay after uh, a little bit and sign up. Uh, but first, I guess you're good. Thank you, Professor Warman. And now we have our own constitutional law expert, Professor Chris Green, to offer his commentary. That's written thank you. Do you so, disagree with anything I said? Yeah, I was just thinking, like, did you actually say anything that I would uh, uh, disagree with? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, 
it is striking, and it's quite striking how, so, so Elon came out with his book uh, kind of early last year, and then uh, Evan Burnick and Randy Barnett came out with their book uh, later last year. Uh, I had my book several several years ago. This is, this is what I'll call my first book on the 14th Amendment, but I, I really do uh, hope I'll get a, a, a second book. Uh, if I can get it as, as reasonably priced as, as uh, these other folks, that'd be, that'd be good. But all three of us agree with Justice Fields' dissent in Slaughterhouse that uh, hostile and discriminating legislation by a state against its own citizens, even outside the Bill of Rights, uh, is the chief thing that the Privileges or Immunities Clause is intended to, to cover. So, um, so there, there really is a, a, a surprising degree of consensus on, you know, that element of the of the privileges or immunities clause. Kurt Lash has his incorporation only view uh, or kind of enumerated rights only view. Um, so that off to the side, really, there is a surprising degree of consensus, and I think future work. Uh, there's a bunch of other people uh, planning to to work on the. Uh, uh, Privileges or meetings clause uh, seems likely that the, that you know that level of, of consensus will uh, will continue. Um, I agree that we should read the Fourteenth Amendment and read constitutional language in general in light of legal conventions, the legal linguistic conventions, what words express in the law. I'm I think a little more inclined to dig into the details of legislative. Uh, you know, what legislators said, what Congress uh, people said, because they were, because and to the extent that uh, those folks were uh, reliable guides about legal might meeting. To the, you know, so one thing you have to do when you look at the, well, you're looking at a cocktail party, you have to figure out who actually is your friend. So, so the level of all that, I sort of think, well, that's just, that's how legal argument works. You, you, you look at, you know, uh, you know, Prosecutor goes into the sea of evidence and looks out and says, well, you know, here's here's all the stuff that indicates why that person did it. And the defense counsel comes in, and, well, you know, there's a bunch of other stuff that indicates he didn't do it. You know, that, that's how the adversarial method works. So so I I can't, I don't really think, you know, you know, look at the evidence and find the stuff that supports you and find somebody else who wants the other result, you know, just see how persuasive this stuff is. But you have to decide. I mean, one thing that interpreters have to do is decide how much of a thing away Bingham was. And how much, of, you know, uh, uh, how reliable uh, Jacob Howard was. I tend to think Jacob Howard uh, is a much more reliable uh, source than Bingham. Um, I would read his introduction of the 14th Amendment a little bit differently from how a number of people read it. Uh, some people read it saying, oh, he's clearly saying the Equal Protection Clause is the vehicle for anti-discrimination norms. I don't think so. I think he mentioned citizenship a number of times there. Uh, in 1869, when he's talking about uh, uh, black suffrage prior to the 15th Amendment, he talks about a Fourth Amendment analogy, not the Equal Protection Clause, uh, as the vehicle, possible vehicle uh, uh, for, for, for black voting. He says, it, it, yes, it's included because it wasn't included in Article 4. But uh, just generally, Jacob Howard, uh, I mean, he's a former attorney general of the state of Michigan. Uh, his stuff from 1862, I've read through the 1862 due process debates. Jacob Howard in 1862 is much more sensible and coherent than Bingham is in 1862. Bingham comes in and says, like, uh, suggests that due process doesn't restrain Congress. And uh, uh, a number of people say, like, Bingham, you're just acting crazy like you always do uh, in 1862. So there are a whole bunch of particular reasons that I, I, I think that uh, that Howard is a good guy. And that causes me to think, like, I would kind of come up, come up with some way. Ultimately, what are we looking at? We're looking at these words, what they express according to, to linguistic convention. It's a broad picture. If you look at the uh, text of the 14th Amendment, no the, the key, key clause, uh, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. All of the different readings insert some implicit qualifiers. So Lash inserts sort of an implicit constitutional, okay, federally enumerated constitutional privileges are the ones that count. It's not directly in the text, 
but a lot of people think, well, it's in context, maybe you could you could do that. But it doesn't fit the context of the Civil Rights Act of 1866 at all. Okay. Uh, both uh, Elon and I, I think we insert an implicit similarly situated. Okay, so no state shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. Does so, I mean you can never get lesser rights? It means lesser rights than similarly situated fellow citizens. Okay. The place where Professor Werman and I disagree is that it seems uh, uh, that he says it's relative to the relative to the rights of similarly situated fellow citizens of the United States in the same state. So I would say if one state is departing significantly from the mainstream of American civil liberty, that is abridging the rights of citizens of the United States relative to the baseline of, of uh, 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 citizens in other states. Okay. This is going to be a smaller difference than you might think because things like free speech are themselves equal citizenship provisions. You think, what is free speech? It's the right of citizens of all creeds, all political and religious creeds, to get the same civil rights. So if you're departing from the American mainstream in uh, uh, with respect to free speech, you're also departing from the mainstream. You're also uh, giving one person in your own state fewer similar civil rights to similarly situated uh, fellow citizens in that same state. So because the First Amendment it can be seen as, as an anti-discrimination provision, that's not going to make a difference. Second Amendment, everybody allows at least some citizens to have guns, okay? So you can, uh, it's not, a, not as obvious, but Second Amendment is going to be an anti-discrimination uh, provision, possibly, uh, at least if, if some people are armed. Um, those piece of evidence and uh, uh, that uh, strikes me as, as most clearly indicating that uh, the 14th Amendment goes beyond, and specifically the privilege of the but goes beyond merely being an anti discrimination provision is from Justice Bradley shortly after he joins the court in 1870. So the slaughterhouse cases are uh, an appeal out of the state system in Louisiana, so the equivalent of, of our Section 1257 uh, uh, jurisdictional provision. but. Um, but the, the people challenging the monopoly uh, went into Louisiana, into a federal court in Louisiana and challenged it. And they got Justice Bradley, who offered some, some comments. Um, and this is the, the, the clearest place where somebody looked at the privileges of the United States and said, is it just an anti discrimination provision or is it also a fundamental rights provision? And Bradley said, well, it's obviously an anti discrimination provision. So obviously, get like, uh, things things like Brown, things like Loving, he, he's not specifically talking about those, but you obviously get anti-discrimination principles that apply outside the Bill of Rights. But do you also get additional stuff? So here's here's what, uh, what Bradley said. Um, it was very ably and contended on the part of the defendants that the 14th Amendment was intended only to secure to all citizens equal capacities before the law. That was at first our view of it. Okay, so this is a quite well-educated legal mind in 1870 saying, well, it's first, it seemed to me when we passed this thing, it was just about interstate equality. So it seemed that, you know, so it seemed to Justice Bradley that, that uh, Elon's view was basically right. Uh, but it does not so read. The language is no state shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. What are the privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States? Are they capacities merely? Are they not also rights? And then uh, our earlier opinion, he said, but the 14th Amendment prohibits any state from abridging the privileges or immunities of, of the citizens of the United States, whether its own citizens or any others. It not merely requires equality of provisions, uh, from privileges, but it demands that the privileges and immunities of all citizens shall be absolutely abridged, unimpaired. Um, Justice Bradley's opinion, his 1870 opinion in the, uh, as a, a circuit justice, uh, was uh, quoted in Congress uh, by Frederick Freelinghausen uh, uh, in, during the debates on the Civil Rights Act of 1875. Nobody suggested, oh, that, you know, that was crazy. He said, you know, this is, this is obviously the correct uh, reading. Um, I also think it fits a little bit better with the precise way in which Justice Field uh, describes the clause in his Slaughterhouse Cases dissent. Uh, so Field uh, says... Uh, where is this? Um, 
what the clause in question, Article 4, did for the protection of the citizens of one state against hostile and discriminating legislations of other states. The 14th Amendment does for the protection of every citizen of the United States against hostile and discriminating legislation against him in favor of others, whether they reside in the same or in different states. So if it were just about intrastate equality, Justice Field could have said what Article 4 does for the discrimination against citizens of other states, the 14th Amendment does for discrimination uh, uh, with a state, purely intrastate. So he could have said that there, but he didn't. He says, if under the fourth article of the Constitution, equality of privileges and immunities is secured between citizens of different states, under the 14th Amendment, the same equality is secured between citizens of the United States. So uh, it seems to me that I, I, you know, we, can, we can read it as requiring equality among all similarly situated citizens of, of the uh, United States, whether locally, which is going to be the most important one. Okay, or nationally. So you get something like uh, the second Justice Harlan's, uh, it's not going to be incorporation of the Bill of Rights as such. It's going to be application of stuff in the Bill of Rights uh, to the states to the extent that we have a national uh, tradition uh, of recognizing that. Right. So you're going to do something like the second Justice Harlan did, which is count up all the states and, and see whether uh, a state is, is in the consensus. Uh, so you get all of the results that, that uh, uh, Elon explained, uh, but you also possibly uh, get these others. Uh, if you're uh, if you take this you know slightly broader or reading, and again most of these are going to be anti-discrimination uh, rights anyway, so it's not going to not going to make uh, make a, a huge difference. But uh, I, I, I don't really have any particular questions, but I just thought you know if you're interested in like what do these these folks fuss over at the at the very uh, uh, fine level of the detail, this is the the fuss oh, back. Yeah, plus, okay. yeah, okay, so. Okay. I don't think this language requires, compels, or even accomplishes what uh, Harlan uh, Bradley said uh, it does. So, uh, in the antebellum period, so why why is incorporation not on, not on the table? Why is incorporation not on the table? No one, no one. Okay, let me back. Everyone in the antebellum period accepted that governments existed for the sake of securing natural rights and that there were certain natural rights, which are just, uh, so civil rights are just natural rights as modified by the rules of civil society. There are certain civil rights, natural rights that all free governments must secure. And that all the free governments did in fact secure. That was, that was a given. What was the issue? The issue was that certain governments were not making good on these principles right, because of slavery. Slavery was making them compromise some of the, these principles that all free governments must secure, like in their own constitutions. They were discriminating in the provisions of these rights that are otherwise secured. But there was no question, okay, that, the, that, that these rights were already guaranteed to white persons, contract, property, and the like. All free governments had to secure these rights. And all 30-some states at the time, 36, I think, all 36 states guaranteed them in some form subject to the varying regulations of the states, okay? So uh, I just want to give you something. So, so those ideas coexisted. The idea that all free governments secured contract and property rights and the idea that the contract and property laws of the 36 states diverged from one another and varied from one another, these ideas coexisted. These ideas coexisted. So, you know, what does it mean to say, well, contracts are a national privilege. Of course they are. They're a natural right that all free governments must secure. But does that mean all 36 states have to have the exact same contract rights? All 36 states have to allow bakers to work more than 10 hours in a day? It's crazy that this idea of federalism and variation in the civil rights of the states coexisted with this notion that all free governments had to secure these rights and did secure these rights even though the regulations vary from state to state. That was a given. Okay, so let's assume, okay, let's assume for sake of argument, okay, that they did want to create some fundamental contract, so some fundamental uh, uh, floor that the privileges are meaning to clause guarantees, the rights that all free governments must secure. I'm not even convinced it does that, because no one was thinking about that problem. 
right? If a state wants to abolish property tomorrow, I think you could do that, right? And everyone thinks my theory is crazy when I say that, right? When it wouldn't be it would be it wouldn't be unconstitutional to abolish property. It's like, well, if you abolish property for everybody, then this is exactly Caroline Products Code for. Can't you trust the democratic process to solve that problem, right? It'd just be the majority tyrannizing itself, right? Which is just self-government, if you ask me, right? Uh, so, but let's grant that there's this fundamental minimum that all free governments must provide. Okay. I grant you political speech is covered. I think that's covered anyway because it's by definition a non-discrimination provision, right? It's not free speech if you could only speak about X point of view, right? Does that mean every single state that all free governments must have the same rule as to whether flag burning should be prohibited, whether violent video games should be advertised to minors, whether you should be able to protest at a dead soldier's funeral, whether it should be prohibited to steal valor, right? To pretend you're a Medal of Honor recipient when you're not whether students should have speech rights, all things that the national government, the national court has decided is, is required under the First Amendment that is applied in all 50 states, right? So even if I grant you that all free governments must, you know, guarantee some minimum of rights, I don't think it that answers most of the questions that would come up to the Supreme Court today. And I think it looks very, very different than incorporation. Right? Maybe, but, that's, but Professor Green isn't advocating incorporation. He's advocating something else. Like I think a Griswold kind of situation where 49 states allow contraception in marriage, we can invalidate that 50th state that doesn't, Connecticut. I don't think you can, right? Unless you can make the claim that all free governments must allow married couples to use contraception, maybe, right? But I don't even think the amendment has that minimum sort of content. You know, so, by the way, while we're speaking, okay, that's the main thing I want to say. While we're speaking about Bradley, okay, um, Bingham, I think, cribbed off of Bradley in his famous 1871 speech where he said, all, all I intended to incorporate the eight amendments, I intended to make them out of the states. Well, you know what he said five weeks earlier, six weeks earlier, as the author of a Judiciary Committee report, the Woodhull report, where Victoria Woodhull claimed the right to vote under the Privileges or Immunities Clause, but political rights were excluded, right? That's why we have the 15th Amendment and the 19th Amendment. What did Bingham say in this report under his name? It is the opinion of the committee that the privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States refer to none other than those privileges or immun and immunities of citizens of the several states referred to in Article 4, Section 2 of the Constitution. But that was a total nut case, okay? He changed his view five weeks later. You know who else was there when Bingham made that 1871 claim? Uh, James Garfield, future president, who, again, was there in 1866. He came the next day after Bingham said this, right? All eight amendments. And Jacob Howard said, I've gone back. I've read the Congressional Globe from 1866. This is the best line in all the legislative history, okay? He says, my colleague, Bingham, my colleague can make, but he cannot unmake history. And then he goes, like, I've read the Congressional Globe. It was all about the concern. The concern was all about the unequal legislation of the states. Is there some evidence for this fundamental rights reading, this slightly broader reading? Yeah, you've got Bradley in 1870. You've got Bingham in 1871 contradicting what he said six weeks earlier in January 1871. I don't know, it's pretty flimsy stuff. If you ask me, that is a thin read to empower the Supreme Court to nationalize these rights and impose them on all 50 states. That is all I want to say. So, questions for either of you, Professor Green? Or is it so obviously right that, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. I'm sorry. We just covered Duchesne. I come on a lot. We just covered Duchesne. We just took the uh, got Dred Scott turning it upside down. So, so they, they can ask me about that. That's the. Yeah, so that's protection of laws. If you want to ask Professor Green about some of that too. That's yeah, um, distinctive stuff. Um, usually, the, the, the best question I've been asked is what is the best evidence against you? And I say that 1871, you know, quote, like, but here's what he says five weeks earlier. So we've already talked about that. So that's done. No, Brad, a lot better. Please. I was thinking, like, legal theorists, is there any, like, judge on the court that you see, like, picking up here from your point of view? Like, where they're like, applying it? That is really the second hardest question I get, which is, why does any of this matter, other than we're here for a free lunch? Uh, <laughs> In fact, the commentator a few weeks ago accused me of being scholastic. I'm like, what's wrong with being scholastic? I thought that was sort of my job. Uh, and so my response is, I get paid just the same. 
right? I, I mean, I care about truth. I care about history. I care about getting the answer right. And what if I care? I mean, like, would it be not? What, what, would it be nice if the Supreme Court got this right? Um, yeah, yeah. Most people think, you know, they ask the you know some originalists. Their their interpretation of the Constitution leads to all the results that they want, right? I think this is a Kilomar's view for the most part. I think it's Randy Barnett. Randy Barnett. Oh, the original meaning is it creates a beautiful libertarian constitution, right? And people ask me, okay, what do you have to give up? What do you have to give up? And I say I have to give up incorporation, just because it's a big thing that you lose, right? Now that's kind of cheating because I'm not really giving that up because I think it would be better without incorporation. So I actually think that's what hurts you. I'm not really uh, giving it up, but people think I'm crazy. People think I'm crazy. And like, you know, Justice Scalia was asked about incorporation. He's like, I'm not about to tell California it can, it can uh, abridge the freedom of speech. I'm an originalist, I'm not a nut, right? He would say, okay, would the world be so bad? Would the world be so bad? Again, I think political speech, Professor Green is right. The Privileges or Immunities Clause already bakes that into it, right? Because if it's an anti-discrimination provision with respect to civil rights under state law, well, if you allow proponents of slavery to speak out, but you prohibit opponents of slavery from speaking out, you're discriminating in the provision of civil rights. Free speech isn't the right to give X opinion on a topic. Everyone equally has the right to speak of, give X opinion. That's not free speech, that's just free speech, right? By definition, free speech entails this non-discrimination component. But does that mean Texas can't ban flag burning? But California can't uh, prohibit the sale, uh, advertising of violent video games to minors? Right? The closest time the Supreme Court ever got to adopting my view was City of Chicago v. McDonald, where the liberals adopted this view. Why? Well, because they didn't like gun rights. So then they finally, right? But that's also unfair because it's just the right they don't like. But they were actually right, I think, about the meaning of the Privileges or Immunities Clause. So I had four votes. It's close. Does that make me totally irrelevant? Yeah. In terms of morally unattractive, um, you, you didn't talk much about uh, voting rights. Yeah. So I, 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 I was like, well, you gotta, you gotta give over Reynolds v. Sims, and that's uh, Akilah popular. You might, yeah, I think we're better off. Akilah Mar says no serious scholar contends that one person, one vote was wrong. Yeah, that's wildly false. Oh, it's okay. lots of serious debate. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, right. There's, there's, there's two of them. Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, I have to give up political rights. Why? Because political rights were not included. Right? What were civil rights? Civil rights belong to all citizens. They're the privileges and immunities of citizens. Political rights, the right to vote, to hold office, and to serve on juries, maybe to serve on militias, are not natural rights. They only exist by virtue of a political community. Right? So they're not natural rights. They were understood to be reserved to a subset of citizens known as electors. The, the highest class of citizens got political rights as well as the civil rights that all citizens get civil rights, okay? This has to be right because that's why we have the 15th Amendment. That's why we have the 19th Amendment. That's why the Privileges or Immunities Clause doesn't cover voting rights, right? Because those are political rights. So, so Howard explains this really clearly in 1869. And this is part of why I love Howard is he's just so much clearer in 1869 than some of his interlocutors. Yeah. And uh, I think you could read his 1866 speech in light of that. It also makes perfect sense of the, the, I agree. the political. And so does that mean one person, one vote's wrong? Yeah, because it's not a political right. Uh, the uh, Because it's a political right not covered by equal protection or privileges or immunities. So you don't get one person, one vote. Now, that's when people say, well, you're crazy. Well, the United States Senate doesn't follow this rule. Right now, some people say, well, yes, that's also bad. And that's anti-democratic or what have you, right? But I'm like, you know, I don't know. If uh, 10 million New Yorkers want to do something stupid, let them do it in New York City, right? But if you want to prohibit hunting, maybe you should get the buy-in of the state legislator representing upstate New York, even if he represents or she represents a smaller population. This is the argument for unequal representation in the Senate before you know, San Francisco, LA, New York want to do something crazy for the whole country, you'd better get some people on board in the Midwest. You need a nationally distributed majority. Well, why not have the same thing at the state level? The states are not these Montesquieuian republics anymore, if they ever were, right? They're, most of them are bigger than the United States was in 1789. Why not have unequal representation, right? As long as you represent communities of interest. Now, maybe there are limits on it, Right? And of course, if you do it on the basis of race, maybe that violates the 15th Amendment, which does guarantee that 
on the basis of race, right? But I don't know. Do I really have to give that up? I mean, yes, but maybe I'm, do I have to feel bad about it? No. Well, most people think I'm crazy. I feel bad. I feel oh. like this is a distaste. So, and some people think like, I want to have a distasteful aspect. Delete that part of the video. Let's talk about this. Okay. Just, yeah, question. Okay. Um, I kind of, I, I might be interpreting what you're saying wrong, but wouldn't allowing the states be, let's just say like, uh, in my undergraduate class on states, and it was like, they're the, the laboratory for the United States federal government in a way. But wouldn't your viewpoint on it allow them to be closer to a pure democracy rather than a republic? Because I mean, our founders created a republic over a democracy for specific reasons. I mean, democracies, pure democracies just don't work because they allow mob rule to take over. And I understand that there's like, without what Green kind of says is a fundamental, I'm just gonna say like socialist underbelly where where you have to have like specific things that go across the United States. And if you don't, someone who's intelligent, let's say like Hitler did, it was a perfect example for this, or anyone who did something like that, he took society, his society in a bubble, created a party around him, and then went around every rule and law, and then found a way to take power, control it, centralize it, and then spread out. Okay, so like, yeah, let me focus on the first thing you started with, okay? Laboratories of democracy, you sounded favorable to that. I hope that's not my airline calling. Uh, that's okay. reasonable, like his view for that. Because I'm going to shut down the laboratories once you get up to. And, that, right. yeah. and so, right. So people say, oh, yes, we want them to be laboratories of democracy, but not laboratories of Bill of Rights, not laboratories of state constitutionalism. And I'm like, are you nuts? Well, why does everyone think I'm crazy? Right? You're the crazy ones, right? You don't want to let states experiment with advertising violent video games to minor? Minors, you don't want to let states experiment with tort law and protesting a dead soldier's funeral. You don't want to let states experiment on student speech. You don't want to let states experiment on X, Y, or Z, right? And if the answer is no, I don't want them to experiment about X, Y, and Z, you better hope that you're in control of the national government and not the other guy, right? And so, yeah, look, look, laboratories of democracy, it's, it's, the, it's the same coin, right? When, when you experiment with democracy, you are enacting laws that coerce people. When you enact laws that coerce people, you're getting rid of liberties and rights, okay? What's the difference if it's a contract right or a property right or an arguably a speech right or a gun right or a search and seizure right or a due process right? Let them experiment. Now, with due process, that is guaranteed by the 14th Amendment, right? But even that, we all get wrong, which I... Yeah, there's time. I do have time for this, but I know. Yeah. I want to sign the books. And yeah, so you know, so I think we uh, we wanted to start the book signing at uh, at one twenty. So if there's a yeah, because I have to drive to Memphis. Hey, yeah, which will last be better. Oh yeah, modern age political rights and civil rights being merged and blurred in a way. Yes, yes. What should we do about that? I get paid just the same. Okay, for the second question. Um, so yes, so the political gerrymandering case. Right? Can you gerrymander on the basis of a political party, or is that unconstitutional? Five justices said this is a non-justiciable political question. Four justices said no, this is equal protection. Nine zero originalists should say it's a political rights question, and the Fourteenth Amendment doesn't guarantee political rights. Can you gerrymander to exclude women, to dilute their voting power, to exclude African Americans? Then you might have a Fifteenth and Nineteenth Amendment. Claim. But that's different. It's very different. Certainly political gerrymandering would be off the table, right? And so, yeah, there's absolutely this combining of political and civil rights going on. Um, but, you know, I lose sleep over other things. But, uh, yeah, good question. Very good question.